Welcome to Nuked Radio. This is episode 84. Today is Thursday, January 10th, 2013. I'm your host, Christina Consolo, and with me today is Jules, who will be working in the background. We also have a very special guest who will be joining us momentarily, Major William B. Fox, who I talked about on Tuesday's show. Since I read the article that he sent, I have had numerous emails asking for links to his work and website, so we are very lucky that he was available to be here today in person. A few quick stories, though, to get us started. Machine guns and assault-type high-capacity weapons are being requested by the NRC to protect citizens from radiological sabotage. And I want to thank B.J. Parsons for sending me this article. I sent it to Any News who posted it today. This article who, that was originally posted on The Hill states the proposed action could reduce the risk that public health will be affected by radiological releases because of the increased likelihood of a successful repulsion of a terrorist attack, the agency contends. How nice that the NRC is concerned about our health all of a sudden. The cost of arming all security guards in the 65 operating plants in the U.S. will be approximately $42 million. Now, an interesting comment that was posted from a nuke worker under the article states that this measure is redundant, that security guards already have access to this type of firepower since 9-11, although I can't confirm this. The public does have 45 days to respond. Any News is also running the U.S. government film from 1960 that we played on Tuesday, where Dr. Frank Baxter is asked, are all the effects of radiation bad? And he answers, most of them are, therefore we must be very careful when we use radiation. I also wanted to let you guys know the video I did entitled, Obama Gets Blasted by Rats in regards to his Hawaiian vacation has been posted on Before It's News. In fact, it's not appearing under the alternative news, it's appearing under national news. And it was the uh, third post under the politics section. So check it out and share that around if you haven't already. And last but not least, the booms are back. Since January 5th, loud booms in multiple states and locations are being reported again. The ones in the U.S. so far have been picked up on seismographs. Utah, Wyoming, Indiana, Salem, Massachusetts, and North Hollywood in L.A. are reporting these booms over the last few days. Now, my family actually heard them last night. There were four quick booms around 1030, and we could actually feel them vibrate the house. Also, I saw some comments that these are also being heard in the UK and France. Now, there are numerous news stories reporting this online, and the Extinction Protocol ran a story about this yesterday. I have a few comments that I want to share with you, and I did talk to my daughter who lives in Utah who said that she was under the impression that it was a rocket launch uh, for her area of the country, but I could not find that confirmed in any news source. This comment appeared on a post from someone named E. I have a buddy over in the States that's been telling me he's been hearing these booms and groaning sounds the last couple of days in the southeast Pennsylvania area. He lives near Westchester in Downingtown. It's freaking him out. He's never heard them before. The earth is groaning and humming. From Cindy on my webpage, hi, I live in Evansville, Indiana, and there have been reports of loud booms all over our city and in Kentucky and a few other areas in the past two days. No one knows where they're coming from. Some say sonic booms or from jets, but obviously this is not normal. And we do have an airport, so if it was normal, people wouldn't be calling and reporting it. Anyway, someone said it reminded them of the 1812 earthquake. And I read where you reported a big sinkhole in Ohio, and we are on the New Madrid fault line. I'm not familiar with the 1812 earthquake, and there are boom sounds being reported, so I thought I would send you a message to see what you think. It's all over our news media here, and some have said it's so loud that it woke them from sleeping, and others have said it's rattled their house. We do have mines, but not here in Evansville. There is not any mining close by for it to be affecting our city. Now, I wrote back to her, no one really knows what's causing this. The Utah incident is being blamed on a possible rocket test. My feeling that is that it's geological in nature, but all we can do is be prepared. 
and have a plan of where to meet up with your family if a big earthquake happens. I live in Michigan and we've had ground shaking and rumbling here too. The St. Lawrence Seaway is a huge fault and points towards you. It may be connected to the New Madrid as well. The thing to remember is earthquakes are hardly ever fatal in themselves. The danger is from building collapse and the nuke plants melting down afterward. Know where the nuke plants are around you just in case and probably head north if a meltdown occurs. And I sent her a link from Greenpeace of how to locate nuke plants near you. Forum post from SB. Here in northwest Georgia, powers went out two times. A few days afterward, heard two loud booms that shook the house, vibrated windows. I walked down the road and saw three local police sitting in a church parking lot. They told me they were trying to find the source of the booms. Another forum post from AC. Warning, these are classic signs of major rift fault activity. If you live within 100 miles of the New Madrid, I strongly suggest you relocate if possible. If not, be prepared for a big one. Many have speculated foreknowledge of a major New Madrid event is what has led to the construction of FEMA camps, the passage of NDAA, passage of property and asset conf confiscation bills, and takeover of all communication bills, etc. Peace and good luck. Another forum post from Canoe for You. In my opinion, many of these booms are from seismic activity. Google the state and helicorder. We are seeing seismic activity all over now. For over three years, I followed the New Madrid, Virginia, and mostly East Coast earthquakes, and there's a big uptick ongoing. Another thread here mentions those in Eastern Kentucky and extending into West Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Northwest Georgia, Alabama, Ohio, and Minnesota, many helicopters in these states are now closed or deleting events. The causes may be planetary alignment, fracking, solar maximum, or harp. The earth has always moved. What's new is man in his arrogance never took solar flares, earthquakes, or even severe weather into account as we built bridges, dams, nuke plants, buried gas lines, buildings, the power grid into account. It will all fail in time. Again, Google any state, your state, and the word helicorder. Find the one closest to you, bookmark it, and check it daily. The Earth is on the move. Another forum post from Resistor. My wife and I heard several deep booms a couple of nights ago at our house here in Middle Tennessee. It was much deeper than gunfire from a hunter, and deer season is over now, or a neighbor out shooting for fun, because we live in the country. One of them even shook the house a little. It didn't sound like the local train and no engine or rail car sound was heard at all. Just loud, deep, distant booms, almost cannon-like. We are used to the local train and gunfire from farmlands not far away. I also grew up in West Nashville and am used to the typical sound of blasting at the rock quarry or for road construction. This was very different and strange. And an email from the UK. Around 10 p.m. Tuesday, the 8th of January, my wife and I were having a smoke in the back garden, and we heard in about five-minute intervals loud rumblings from the heavens. It was a heart-sickening sound which vibrated through our heart and body. That's how I will describe it. I've never heard anything like it. It lasted for around 20 seconds, then disappeared for around five minutes, and then came back. And another thing, we haven't seen clear skies for about three weeks day or night until last night and it was really clear the stars were sparkling and then that weird loud rumbling came from above. We'll post a link and pin it to the top of the Ratchet page today. Um, there's an article that kind of sums up all of the booms that have been heard in the last week on the extinction protocol. I don't have the link handy but I'll post it on the Ratchet page. We'll pin it to the top and because this is such a concern for so many people, you can post any of your um, findings or observations on that link. Now, our guest today, Major William B. Fox, has been intensively researching individual and group radiation protection measures since Fukushima. His website, AmericaFirstBooks.com, contains what he calls extremely urgent info regarding continuing global radiation warfare. His intensive research brought him to Loren Murray, one of our favorite Fukushima experts, who he now considers a friend and ally. A summary of the Fukushima disaster is stated on his website as follows. The ongoing nuclear radiation catastrophe following the 311-2011 Japanese earthquake and tsunami has many disturbing false flag characteristics in common 
with the BP Gulf crisis listed below. Contrary to mainstream media reports, it may wind up being more than a hundred to a thousand times worse than Chernobyl and will likely cause horrifying health problems for many Americans as well as the Japanese. Please link to our continually updated pages. The first page is Fukushima Catastrophe Open Source Intelligence Summary Page. This web page provides strong evidence that the nuclear reactor meltdowns were ultimately caused by deliberate sabotage utilizing Mossad CIA's Stuxnet virus. Another page, the aerial dance of mass death and genetic destruction, a week-by-week -week Fukushima radiation and fallout projection and companion articles. The plume chart above estimates the spread of radioactive Neptunium-239 over North America on March 24, 2011. Other very dangerous isotopes such as plutonium-239, cesium-137, and iodine-131 provided a witch's brew of fallout. The general public was never adequately warned about this danger. This chart is just one example contained in the week-by-week -week chart series. The tasteless, colorless, invisible radiation threat circling the northern hemisphere is extremely real. It threatens to genocide major portions of the Japanese people and much of America as well. Each web page in the series also lists articles that provide deep background. It also has an individual and group radiation protection page, What You Don't Know Will Hurt You, Fukushima Radiation is Silently Impacting on All Americans, There Are Protective Measures You Must Know About Here. He also has a page for Loren Murray, a page for Dr. Chris Busby, and a nuclear 9-11 in American Fukushima, why flooded Fort Calhoun, Nebraska in 2011 and other crippled nuclear power plants had experts on edge, and the nuclear industry danger is not over yet. And there's also a very informative page on the Chernobyl catastrophe, the horrific dress rehearsal for the even more horrific Fukushima disaster. The impact since the 1986 meltdown tells us what we all need to know, what Fukushima can do to our future. So without further ado, Major Fox, welcome to Nuked Radio. Well, my pleasure to be on your show. I consider quite an honor. <laughs> well, it's an honor to have you. Please share with our listeners who you are and what your background is. All right. Well, I... Uh, Born and raised in uh, Florida, uh, but then wound up living around the country uh, and uh, did very well in school, graduated uh, Phi Beta Kappa from uh, summa cum laude from the University of Southern California. My father was a, a college professor at the University of Florida, so I, I've always sort of reveled in the academic world and the world of research and analysis, which I consider my main focus right now. However, my real education came when uh, I graduated from the uh, Harvard Business School in 1984, and I think <laughs> that year has an appropriately Orwellian ring to it uh, because I discovered that in many ways uh, America uh, was just as bad as what George Orwell uh, described in his uh, novel, uh, but in more subtle ways. Uh, and, and in some ways more dangerous ways. And uh, my first job out of the business school, I had, having uh, gone to the um, University of Southern California, I'd taken a number of courses in cinema, and I was interested in the um, uh, film industry and media. Uh, actually, I've always been an eclectic individual. I've had a wide variety of uh, interests. I, I took a natural science curriculum. Uh, I had also entertained for a while the idea of possibly becoming a a medical doctor, so I took the full pre-med curriculum. So I, I've been so far all over the map. Uh, but I also came from a family with strong military roots. I have a uh, uh, grandfather who had served under George Patton in North Africa and became a full colonel. And uh, he had a brother-in-law named uh, Colonel Creed Bates who lived in a log cabin and was sort of a country gentleman in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So that exposed me to the pioneer heritage in America. Uh, so uh, I've been very diversified. I've lived all over the country, you know, on the West Coast, Los Angeles, in Florida, North Carolina, Washington, D.C., uh, Hawaii, uh, in Washington and Oregon, and, uh, you know, more recently now I've been in uh, Western uh, Pennsylvania. So, uh, and I lived in New York City for 10 years. But anyway, my, my real education in many ways began when my first job out of the Harvard Business School was as a senior financial analyst 
at the CBS headquarters in Midtown Manhattan at uh, what they call Black Rock, the CBS headquarters. And um, over the next five years, I began to uh, split from what you might call the matrix. I began to understand that we live in a very Orwellian, very thought-controlled society. So that's that's an important story there is how I began to break out of the matrix. Then the next part of the story is um, I, I have experienced as a, as a real estate broker for around nine or ten years and then in New York and then later I became a stockbroker and did that for approximately ten years in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon and Washington State. Uh, and then I uh, got involved in um, – so I have a lot of business experience – uh, got involved in uh, trying to uh, handle ebooks uh, that help educate the public about this horrible matrix that we're in. And so I got involved with uh, Michael Collins Piper, who's the author of Final Judgment, uh, which provides strong evidence that the Mossad and, and Israel uh, were the ringleaders in orchestrating the John F. Kennedy assassination. I handcrafted that book. He, he works with American Free Press. Uh, into an ebook uh, personally. It took me about a week to do it because I felt that was a real landmark. And uh, however, before I really was able to ramp up my ebook inventory, uh, I was very concerned that Portland, Oregon might be hit by a false flag attack because not only was I following American Free Press very closely and other alternative media, uh, but I, well, as a consequence actually of listening to alternative media, I came across a person named Eric May, a former Army intelligence officer who voiced concern as well as a number of uh, Portland area activist groups that Portland could become the target of a false flag dirty nuke attack. And so I called up Eric May, and he really stuck it to me. I had um, actually out of college, I'd gone into the Marine Corps, and uh, I had, uh, uh, although my original background was in supply and logistics, um, I had, of course, gone through officer candidate school. Uh, I... It, when I was in the reserves, I then at the rank of a captain and then later a major, I belonged to a public affairs uh, a Marine Corps a reserve unit uh, in New York City uh, that held a symposium uh, once a year where uh, Marine Corps commanders, often the rank up to colonel, even uh, brigadier general, would come and uh, sort of meet the press and hear about media issues. And so I helped host that with this unit, and we would conduct hot seat interviews. And once I orchestrated uh, a producer of 60 Minutes, since I worked at CBS for a year, uh, to come and talk to the group. And uh, Tom Wolf, who's a major author, was a regular, and uh, also uh, one of the uh, publishers of the uh, New York Times had – uh, owners had served in the Marine Corps during World War II, so we usually had a luncheon at the New York Times. And so uh, that was also part of my stepping out of the matrix. I uh, had uh, done a stint of active duty as a Marine Corps public affairs officer at Central Command uh, in uh, Florida. And uh, I uh, was really, at that time, this was the pre-Internet era, and I, I found it kind of shocking to see how... Uh, Part of the job was to follow breaking news and to prepare five news stories, uh, one minute each, to brief the commanding general of Central Command uh, every morning. And uh, so uh, what was shocking to me is in following the New York Times and Washington Post, I also had access to something called FIBIS, which is Foreign Broadcast Information Service, which is actually uh, – uh, the CIA runs that, and they translate foreign media. And so I could read what the Arab press and other Middle Eastern uh, and Central Asian uh, media had to say about certain stories and compare and contrast that to what the New York Times and Washington Post said. And it occurred to me that, oh my, you know, we, we really do live in a Norwegian society, that we're getting highly filtered news. Um, so then later, uh, I decided I wanted to try to get involved in the intelligence world. So I got a I uh, became also in charge of an intelligence unit, an interrogation translation team in Garden City, New York, uh, and did that for two years. And so that was my exposure to the uh, intelligence world. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the upshot is uh, getting involved with Captain May. Uh, I became an activist. Uh, I traveled down to the National Guard headquarters. Uh, this is now we're talking about 2007 during Operation uh, Noble Resolve because uh, Captain May really stuck it to me. He said that he had uh, Lou Gehrig's disease and he was dying and he had given his all for his country. And what's what's your excuse, Major? <laughs> and he really stuck it to me, and and I felt I did, I felt I didn't I, I 
the, the only thing I could do if I had even an ounce of manhood was to, um, since I had a background as a writer and uh, I understand the power of media, that I, I couldn't say no to where he said, we need somebody like you to go down to the National Guard headquarters in Selma, Oregon, and start asking questions because there's nobody in the media who has the guts to go there and ask the questions that need to be asked about this exercise, which we believe could be hijacked and taken live and turn into another 9-11. So I went to the National Guard headquarters, and having lived in New York and having you know, been exposed, you know, I myself, I view myself, I'm not an important person, but, you know, by belonging to organizations like the Harvard Business School Club and Harvard Club and attending meetings of venture capital groups, I was about, you know, I was like the fly on the wall in a John Dos Passos novel where, you know, I, I'm sort of like the camera eye. I'm not important, but I'm watching people. I'm one degree or two degrees of separation from people who really are important, who are movers and shakers. And, and frankly, while living in New York City, I, I started getting an inkling about what's really going on in America and the really history of America, and it really bothered me very, very deeply that it's very different than what I was told about in college or what I learned about in high school or, or, and, and things that I should have been told in the privacy of my own home or in locker rooms that I was never told. And uh, so that, that was a big wake-up. So anyway, when I went to National Guard headquarters, I started hearing talk about how – they were trying to uh, model everything and centralize everything in Washington, D.C. And I thought, wait a second, there's something really wrong here uh, because normally crisis response, uh, often the most effective response is decentralized because people are closest to the unfolding action can respond to it better. And I can get into discussion about, you know, for example, even the, the, the Germans, the Nazis, and the Blitzkrieg, believe it or not, they promoted decentralization. It was legitimate to disobey orders within the Nazi high command and the Blitzkrieg because they knew that in a fluid, mobile situation, people who are closest to the action uh, uh, know what's best to be done right then and there uh, compared to the people at top headquarters. That's one reason why Erwin Rommel, uh, who was particularly famous for maneuver warfare in North Africa, often rode in a squad car near the front so it could be close to the unfolding action. And so what I smelled was some kind of megalomaniacal control freak mentality uh, back in Washington, D.C., in New York, that's trying to take over complete control of this country uh, in ways that contradict what I consider to be rational, decentralized practices to handle real crises. And I, having lived in New York City, uh, I kind of could smell in my nostrils uh, mega, me, uh, megalomaniacal ethnic flavor, uh, control freak flavor behind all this, having been exposed to uh, Wall Street uh, investment bankers I'd actually interviewed and, you know, uh, with people at the major Wall Street firms and, and new people who worked for them uh, through my connections there. So uh, I, I said, uh, this, uh, this does look scary to me. I, I don't like the smell of it. It looks like all the worst things that I feared. So I, I, you know, I felt like there's no harm done in writing an article for the Lone Star Iconoclast. I think Leon Smith is a real hero who ran that. He was one of the first critics of George Bush and all of the corruption of his administration. In fact, uh, kind of was a thorn in the Bush administration's side by running the Peace House and having a, a semi-headquarters uh, in Crawford, Texas, near the Bush uh, White House, Western White House in Texas. So, um, you know, I wrote an article for Lone Star Conoclast about my experiences, and then I just sort of got sucked into it. And uh, then when Operation Top Off rolled around in October, uh, things really looked scary where, uh, you know, the, the, uh, there had been a, a, a study done uh, – which people with Harvard and Stanford had done a dirty nuke scenario, and the thing looked kind of a little bit too uh, realistic to me in terms of the idea of using the steel bridge in Portland, Oregon as the site of a – well, actually, there's a place further north, and then later on it's the steel bridge as a dirty nuke site. And uh, it turned out that, as an amazing coincidence, the first day of that exercise, Vladimir Putin went to Iran, and he was the first – Russian leader to do that since Joseph Stalin during World War II. And that was a very spooky coincidence. I had this feeling that Vladimir Putin uh, used himself as a human shield to prevent uh, the U.S. and Israel from attacking Iran. And that was probably the major factor. In fact, I'm not the only person who felt that way. Webster Tarpley has come out and uh, stated that opinion himself. So then somebody stepped forward and, and encouraged me to really focus on this uh, – and provide support and so on uh, to to support trying to interdict with Captain May 
uh, possible false flag attacks. So I sort of put a lot of other things on the uh, the back burner, which in a way that was a difficult uh, situation because there are a lot of other people who I think are very, very important uh, in terms of what they're doing to help educate the public, to help us break out of the matrix. Uh, one of them was the late uh, Eustace Mullins. I had uh, met him at a uh, Barnes Review um, and uh, American Free Press Conference 2006. In fact, drove him back to his home in Staunton, Virginia, and I wanted to create a, a profile page of Eustace Mullins and his works. And there's some other people that I wanted very badly to work with, including uh, doing more work with the American Free Press. And I, I was caught in a horrible position because I really did feel threatened by that, that we were going to – there's a strong chance that there are some very evil people who are going to try to hit us with another 9-11 and nuke one of our cities. And I felt that maybe working with Captain May and the Lone Star Conoclast and Dr. James Fetzer, who's also a former Marine officer, does a real deal a TV show, and working with him. And then there's a former intelligence staff and uh, CO uh, uh, named uh, 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 his, uh, Donald Buswell. And uh, he's been also a valuable uh, ally. So I, I felt that maybe that, you know, if, if a nuke goes off and we, we have martial law and a police state dictatorship, you know, what's the point of doing all this more macro philosophical stuff, even though it's extremely important in the long run, if uh, there is no long run, if we, we get nuked in the short run. So that was my thinking. So I, I started getting very intensively focused on uh, – you know, working on the whole false flag situ threat situation and, and end up writing what I call the Mission of Conscience a trilogy where I go into things like the Madrid bombing, uh, the uh, London 7-7 attack, the Mumbai bombings, and, and it's really try to get into the dynamics trying to understand, you know, who's doing these false flag attacks, why are they doing, and I did a whole profile page on the uh, Oslo Toya uh, 22 July attack. And uh, I think that that has Mossad, CIA, MI6 fingerprints all over that. I think Brevik was a patsy. The strong evidence there were other shooters on Atoya Island. I think it was beyond uh, strong evidence of beyond Brevik's capabilities to set off a bomb at the magnitude went off in Oslo. And I also, it's now I have a personal thing in this because my mother comes from Norway, and I am involved with Norwegian American organizations, and so I this is uh, personal for me. So uh, that was another motivation to get involved in that. So I, I've been sort of back and forth. Now I'm, of course, I'm still on this this whole nuclear thing, um, which is, remains extremely ominous. Uh, I, I'm almost becoming like a junior uh, medical student. I'm trying to study all these different sources. Uh, like Dr. John Apsley's written a very good book. Dr. Mark Circus has a lot of good stuff. Uh, I have all these books in front of me. Uh, Radiation Protective Foods by Sarah Shannon. That's good. Uh, Sherry Rogers. I've discovered her fairly recently. I've spent a lot of time listening to just about all her back shows on the Power Hour with Joyce Riley. Uh, she did a very classic book called Detoxify or Die. She's written many other books like uh, Is Your Cardiologist Killing You and um, uh, The EI Syndrome. It, it's a very long list. Uh, and uh, I, I'm trying to get up to running speed, trying to just absorb and integrate this stuff uh, because I think uh, someone like Sherry Rogers supplies an important part of the overall jigsaw puzzle, the, the understanding we need to, to try to defend ourselves as well as – I mean, there's so many areas. There's, there's the medical, biological, radiation protection aspect. Uh, I think uh, you know, getting your own inspector alert. And, and being able to actually show people things beeping isn't a good idea. I've been promoting the whole thing with the uh, the respirators. Uh, that's a good idea. Uh, but then also there's sort of this whole macro philosophical thing of how we're sort of in this matrix. There are these people who are trying to brainwash us and steer us, and and we need to penetrate that as well to gain control of our own destiny. So it, it's a lot of stuff happening on many different levels. I, I hope that. It's helpful as at least some introductory background. <laughs> when when you when you first heard about the 9.0 earthquake and the tsunami and the fact that a number of nuke plants were taken out from it, I think uh, Spiegel had reported a German newspaper that um, 10 to 14 nuke plants actually experienced problems. Did you immediately think that this was a false flag, or what told you what allowed you to form that opinion as time well, went on? Yeah, actually, uh, certainly compared to most people, I was way up the curve because I had my fingers on a continuing basis on all the major alternative media. For example, I created a very long what I call open source intelligence 
alternative media summary page on BP Golf. And I had been following Jeff Rents at Rents.com closely because he was interviewing top uh, experts on what was happening in, in that arena. So when Fukushima took place, uh, you know, I, I immediately caught what Jeff Rents was saying, as well as Alex Jones. I, Alex Jones, uh, you know, he's controversial. Some people say he's limited hangout. Other people say he's the best thing since sliced bread for the American right or conservative movement or whatever, a patriot movement. Uh, in many ways, I think if it's like a multiple choice test, all of the above is, is true. But I, it, it just so happened at that time I was listening to Alex Jones as well. And also Captain Eric May uh, issued some alerts, which were amazingly uh, timely in uh, retrospect. If you go to the uh, Captain May archive, uh, he issued an alert dated March 14th called the New Hiroshima Part 1 Deadly Discovery. And uh, he caught on. He actually, Captain Eric May was a former Army intelligence officer. Uh, of course, at the time he's writing this, he was already using his eyes to operate a computer. He's suffering from ALS. When I, I spent a year near him in Houston to write the Mission of Conscience series, and, uh, you know, he was already, when I first met him in uh, late uh, December 2009, uh, he uh, was uh, already a, uh, or actually 2008, and then uh, I ended up spending mid-2009 to mid-2010, a year in Houston near him. When I first met him in December 2008, he was a uh, already a, a, quadra, a total quadriplegic. And so he's an amazing individual, able to operate everything by eye movement. But he, he w had spent part of his uh, tour before he became a full-blown intelligence officer nu as a nuclear biological chemical officer. And he, he grasped the, the implications pretty quickly. So, uh, but... You know, I my focus was initially in three different areas simultaneously. It was like, um, was this uh, the the earthquake due to HARP, uh, and then was this overall thing a um, a false flag, and then the uh, next part is how serious is this in terms of the uh, nuclear reactors going down? And at that time, you know, I wasn't fully aware of the implications of Chernobyl. And, and what that meant, how that's like a Rosetta Stone of everything we can expect coming from Fukushima. Just take what happened with Chernobyl and, and give a multiplier factor of uh, what, what you think the severity might be, whether it's, uh, you know, some people like John Apsley have revised up to like 20 to 30 times, uh, or it could go up to 70 times. Chris Busby uh, gave a, put out a video where he thought it could be as much as 300 times worse uh, in fact, when he's talking about how he measured the results of car filters, um, it, it, it seemed like uh, it, it could be about 300 times worse than what was experienced in Britain at the time of uh, Chernobyl. So there are a lot of different indicators uh, and, and certainly the many different ways to try to do a, a complete analysis. Well, actually, they're, they're about they're, – it reminds me of doing real estate appraisals where there's no one way typically – you can evaluate the worth of a building. You have to look at it from different perspectives like the, the market value approach, the um, reproduction uh, approach, um, and the income approach. And similarly, to evaluate Fukushima, uh, the Japanese government and the U.S. government and other sources have been spreading so much information or been censoring so much that we have to take fragments and, and using different perspectives, see what kind of picture we can put together. And one one approach, like you're alluding to, is it's probably uh, you know more than like just uh, three uh, reactors that are going to melt down. There, there are others that there's evidence that have melted down, have made major emissions, and uh, first we can do analysis of what's the total amount of nuclear fuel they likely have. But the problem with that is the Japanese government has been lying to us, and there's strong evidence that Fukushima is used as a, a plutonium production facility for nuclear weapons. So it's possible they, they really haven't given us the full figures. I mean, what we've gotten is what we've gotten so far, you know, like uh, 600,000 fuel rods, uh, that alone is scary enough. Um, but it's possible it could be even more in their emissions elsewhere. Now, another approach is to look at what radiation monitors have been picking up, like what I have in my series from the EPA RADnet that show these horrible spikes, you know, up to like 900 counts per minute when 100 counts per minute is RADnet. And different places around the country like Phoenix 
or uh, uh, in, in places in uh, uh, Idaho or uh, in uh, California, uh, and and that's been going on and on. Porter blog at, at potrblog.com. Uh, he's been getting consistently high hot rains in St. Louis. Uh, I mean, these things are are very concerning. So, take uh, there actually have been some analyses of different nuclear stations, like in California, first broke where they they tested a wide span of radionuclides. Um, and in fact, uh, Lauren Murray uh, said that when a nuclear plant melts down, uh, it releases all the radioactive isotopes of a nuclear bomb blast, which according to TVA study, is uh, it's a huge number. It's uh, well over 1,300. Um, and uh, in fact, Dr. Chris Busby gave an amazing interview, probably the most strident interview that he has given uh, was with Alex Jones on March 17th. Uh, and he said one problem is that uh, currently uh, using uh, regular Geiger counters to measure gamma radiation, they can only measure uh, less than 50% of what's coming out of Fukushima because plutonium is a pure alpha emitter, and then you have carbon-14, and then you have tritium, uh, which is a, a very major source of radioactive pollution, and that's normally not even showing up on uh, a lot of the, the counters. So we're getting a, a full uh, uh, witch's brew. So anyway, you can I, I guess to finish up as as you sort of look at what are the what are the the various radiation measuring devices around the world that have some degree of reliability, it, how can we back out infer from that what the magnitude of uh, this uh, catastrophe is? So that's uh, another approach, and uh, then uh, you know try to and then look at Chernobyl as a uh, comparable and look at the degree of disinformation and uh, look at the rate of uh, illness effects on plants and, and sort of taking all these fragments of information and try to put together a picture of what we're really facing. Um, Loren Murray did a wonderful interview on ExoPolitics early in the disaster where she had pulled the RADNET data before the machines were taken offline and they were kept offline for three weeks and possibly recalibrated at that time at, at um, certain intervals when areas around the country have read high, the filters have been pulled to be changed, and a filter change should only take about 20 minutes with one of these machines. Sometimes the machines are kept offline for days. It's very frustrating. I mean, I try to use some of the, the government data and crowdsource data to um, try to put together a picture along with what I've learned about atmospheric fallout and how it behaves from her. She helped me do um, fallout forecasts for a few months, um, talking about how these particles um, act in the tropopause. It's not as much the jet stream as it is the tropopause where most of our storm systems are generated from, that these particles fall out. But every, every 45 days, Japan has measured this plume that's circling the planet where um, the most massive quantity of these radionuclides are coming from but they're constantly being re-released through different mechanisms. Wind is one, even um, evaporation from the ground in Japan where this stuff has landed and has gone into the soil. When it gets hot enough there, it gets steamed out of the ground and then it gets released again. And it could be you know, decades, if ever, that we find out the true extent of this problem because every um, chain of command it has something to gain by lying about this. And the people who are going to pay the price are the people who are downwind. At, at what point did you realize that we were in big trouble where you decided to devote so much of your time to researching this problem? You know, that was the uh, March 17th, uh, 2011 uh, interview with Alex Jones and Chris Busby. Um, and actually, it's kind of like a volleyball game where certain sources set up the ball and then somebody else spikes it. So uh, that spiked the ball. But what set it up is um, a number of different sources. It was uh, Captain Eric May uh, issuing an alert about uh, uh, the, the, what I mentioned, the, the Hiroshima alert. Uh, then uh, on uh, March 14th, Jeff Rents interviewed Lauren Murray, and uh, she talked about uh, – the uh, what had happened with the USS Ronald Reagan and uh, the extreme folly of building nuclear power plants on uh, all the active faults. It's the worst place in the world to build them in Japan. 
Um, so, and then Mark Glenn, uh, who's an activist uh, with Cross and Crescent, interviewed Keith Johnson and uh, Jonathan Isaiah on uh, the strong possibility that Israel Stuxnet virus was used to uh, bring on the meltdown of the reactors in Japan. In fact, uh, according to Lauren Murray and other sources, the uh, Stuxnet virus was found in uh, September and October uh, in uh, 2010 in computers in Japan. Previously, it had been used to sabotage uh, the, um, uh, the var various devices used to uh, filter um, uh, radionuclides uh, at the Bashir plant in Iran. And uh, so uh, uh, Warren Murray claims, according to her sources, that uh, the Stuxnet, in fact, sabotage was the ultimate cause. It was more than just the fact that the backup generators were flooded and the batteries weren't working, but actually the Japanese were able to fix things and get things going up again and she believes that there was a downlink from a satellite to the computer systems. That as soon as they uh, were able to fix the uh, Stuxnet virus problem, the, the, the virus attacked again and prevented them from cooling the reactors. And within 90 minutes, without any cooling, the reactors go into meltdown. So uh, anyway, though, that, that set up the ball. Uh, oh, then also Jeff Rents had an interview with Yoichi Shimatsu, and he's been a regular with an interview ever since, about once a week, once every two weeks at Rents.com. Uh, Yoichi Shimatsu is a, uh, claims to be a, a Japanese uh, journalist. Uh, he's been based in Hong Kong, very intelligent individual. Uh, that interview, uh, which I transcribed myself on March 15th, has a lot of important information and bits and pieces. But those things set up the ball. But what really, the grand slam that spiked it for me, and, you know, often you, you know, people say, where were you when something, can you remember where you were when something happened? Uh, I can't remember where I was with the Yoichi Shimatsu interview, but when I listened to the Lauren Ray interview, uh, I know where I was. I was out jogging, listening to the interview on an MP3 player, and I remember exactly where I was jogging up a hill, roughly the time of day, what things looked like. And I also remember when I listened to I, I listened to the MP3 that night after it was given on March 17th, the Alex Jones interview with Dr. Busby, and he made points. I mean, that was the most I've listened to virtually all of Dr. Busby's interviews, and for in fact, I transcribed the one that you did with him. That interview he gave on March 17th was probably the most strident, most alarming interview that both he and Alex Jones have ever given on Fukushima. And uh, in that interview, uh, Alex Jones uh, and Busby talked about 600,000 nuclear fuel rods, 1,000 tons of nuclear material in ponds, uh, fuel rods blown 3,000 feet in the air. Um, almost, He said it's almost certain, uh, Dr. Busby said that the pressure vessels have been breached. Uh, he talked about how half the radiation can't be measured with Geiger counters. Uh, later in the interview, he recommended people stay inside one's house and use duct tape to seal things up. And uh, how uh, this is part of a globalist, uh, global genocide. It could be part of a global genocide uh, program, and it's backfiring on, on uh, top globalist uh, plutocrats because even their own kids are becoming more sterile. The sperm count even in Israel, is down like 70 or 80 percent, and someone forecasted the trend continues that there'll be uh, so many sterile males in Israel that Israel will be finished by the year 2020. And that, I mean, I could go on with other details, but I, I remember where I was when I heard that on MP3. I, you know, I like, was out jogging. I, I remember I was out in the West Pennsylvania countryside, and it was at night, and I can remember the silhouettes of the hills and uh, the houses and the fact that I was several blocks from a, a British Petroleum fuel station down the road and there was a pothole in the road. I, I remember exactly where I was when I heard that. And at that moment, I got into total gear and I spent all my time putting together my uh, what I call my open source intelligence uh, alternative media summary page on Fukushima. And I put it together to the extent that I felt I could post it about a week later which I did. I posted it then. And uh, then later on, then I started listening to everybody. I listened to Dr. With, within that following week, I listened to Dr. Helen Caldicott, uh, who, who delivered a very scary uh, interview. And then on March 21st, Dr. Fetzer interviewed Lauren Murray. Actually, Lauren Murray was very early on this. Lauren Murray was interviewed by um, a radio uh, in, 
uh, Sydney, where she, uh, Australia, uh, where um, almost like the first, second day, that was uh, March 13th uh, on Sydney radio. She just said that she, uh, the whole thing was ter- for everybody she knew, uh, her close associates, they, they were just terrified. They, they understood immediately the implications and uh, how things going to melt down. And then uh, later on, then, of course, she really started hitting things home on uh, March 20th. Uh, Alfred Weber interviewed her. That's on YouTube on the Japan earthquake. Uh, and uh, she started talking about the uh, DOE bankers. In fact, I started transcribing some of her interviews. That that March 20th interview is titled Japan Earthquake and Nuclear Accident or Tectonic Nuclear Warfare. I mean, that was hardcore. That, I was just like listening to the Buzz March 17th Busby Alex Jones interview. I mean, I, my, when I heard that, I said, man, that is hardcore. These people are bearing their souls, I can tell. They're really worried, and they're really letting it all hang out. Um, you know, somewhat paradoxically, um, a little bit later, Busby uh, gave an interview uh, with uh, Joyce Riley on the Power Hour. And um, interestingly enough, uh, Busby wasn't as strident. He kind of, you know, it wasn't wasn't as hardcore as he was with Alex Jones. I, I think that was a unique event. There was something in their mood where they were just letting it all hang out on March 17th. So I think I need to go back and watch that interview again. I re- yeah. I remember it, but not in, in as much detail. Yeah, the title just shared with us. The, the the title of the interview is uh, British scientist Christopher Busby. Uh, you can just Google the, the health. Hello, you still there? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, the I, I just somebody tried to reach me on Skype and I got a pop up screen, but it was obviously nothing to do with the show. Fortunately, it said British scientist Christopher Busby, the health effects of ionizing radiation. Alex Jones one slash three. So you get the first of three segments. They're each roughly about fifteen minutes apiece on March seventeenth. That that should Google right up on what I just said. Major Fox, you know, I need to ask you this because you really, you know so much about this and you really get it, how important it is. Um, something that's always puzzled me is that I don't, knowing how bad Fukushima is, I don't understand how our government thinks that it's going to get away with keeping this from the people with the, this massive cover-up that's going on, which makes me concerned that maybe the government knows something else is coming that will make Fukushima not matter. And with what you know about false flags and the banking system and um, the state of our economy, is that concern you as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that the uh, globalist bankers, the uh, Rothschild City of London, the UK monarchy, and, and this is an area, incidentally, that Lauren Murray uh, gets into quite a lot, um, that uh, they painted themselves in a corner. And uh, Actually, what we need to back rewind the tape a little bit, I, and maybe you know, my background being in New York uh, has given me an important perspective. I remember back in uh, 1990, actually 19 in the mid 1980s, there was a major uh, push in the business press uh, about the reindustrialization of America, and America was basically put on notice. In fact, uh, I remember. Uh, there were uh, some professors with the, uh, the Harvard Business School and another one, I believe, with the University of Chicago, uh, the Scott and Charrington Report, who actually did a road tour. And they pointed out that America has been in competitiveness decline since the 1960s and that America needed to revitalize its uh, industrial base. That in a, in, There's, a, in fact, an excellent book that talks about uh, the, the need for a uh, to maintain a hard industry uh, that talks about how uh, a healthy economy needs to have about a third of its uh, economy in hard industry. Uh, and what had happened since the 60s is America in those decades lost about 75 percent of its hard industry. And in fact, uh, hard industry is the real prop of a real economy. Uh, and so if you lose your and, and this segues into good discussion about why I think Henry Ford is such a terrific hero because he was a champion of the old wasp America uh, which had the old Protestant work ethic which promoted craftsmanship and you know under promising and over delivering and taking a long-term perspective 
and focusing on making better products rather than financial manipulation. And that was the American 19th century. America actually had an industrial base that got to a point that was it was nearly uh, larger than that of England and Germany and France combined. And the standard of living in the United States for the average American worker was nearly twice that of uh, European workers. And uh, America had totally different trade practices rather than shipping factories and other assets overseas to lowest cost labor in search of ever lower labor like in China and elsewhere, Mexico. Uh, the philosophy was the opposite. It had high, uh, protective tariffs to protect American industry, and the focus was reinvesting in American workers and building more American factories. In fact, Henry Ford voluntarily paid his workers twice the average industry scale compared to other auto manufacturers because he felt that American workers in the car industry should be able to afford their own product. And he believed he also, uh, there's so many neat things I can say about things I like about Henry Ford. In fact, I personally crafted an e-book of his work, My Life and Work, where he talks about, uh, you know, how he tinkered and, and developed, was a pioneer in, in developing a mass production car, which became the Model T, and his, his, his general social philosophy. And unfortunately, the people who grabbed control of America in the 20th century have a very different social and political philosophy. They're geared more towards financial speculation and making quick gain and going for lowest cost labor rather than developing uh, uh, industry, which actually uh, there's nothing that can scale productivity like manufacturing. Uh, you reach a dead end when you try to go for the lowest cost labor. So uh, basically by allowing and promoting the outsourcing of American industry and the loss of American industry, uh, the so-called globalists, the Rothschild City of London and other allies, the, the Goldman Sachs folks and these other people, basically cut Americans' throat economically, a real economy. And so, you know, they were served notice You're in the mid-1980s. In fact, there's even a picture on the cover of Business Week magazine called The Reindustrialization of America. And they were served notice, and rather than rebuild the American middle class and rebuild American industry, they decided to go for broke with high-level intrigue, with wars of conquest in the Middle East, to grab for uh, oil resources and other things. So they painted themselves in a the corner, and they're very desperate, and now they're, they're using us, other desperate uh, uh, strategies because uh, they realize they really fouled up big time, and uh, they have really damaged this country, and uh, they're really... Uh, afraid of, of what can happen to them if people really catch on to what's going on. I what? wanted to I wanted to bring up with you um, also because of your uh, military background. What do you think about the Department of Defense's assertion that DU is harmless? <laughs> well, Which it says right on their website. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I actually met Dr. Doug Rocky at the. Uh, 2006 Barnes Review American Free Press Conference uh, in um, Washington, D.C., and uh, from the first time I heard his talk, I, I was sold on the problem with DU, and I, I met with him and said, I'd like to build a web page to uh, present your point of view, and uh, then, of course, later I discovered Lauren Murray, and I became a big fan of hers. This was like, and so uh, the long and short is... Uh, you know, I, I carry an e-book by Michael Collins Piper called The High Priest of War about the Zionist neocons who hijacked the Pentagon. And, uh, you, you know, this is just part of uh, the Rothschild City of London Zionist neocon, neocon hijacking of America. I think there are a lot of good people in the U.S. military, particularly in the lower the mid-levels. That's probably generally true of a lot of areas of the U.S. government. But unfortunately, our political situation is such that some very – Evil people like the Zionist neocons in the Pentagon, the Richard Pearls, the Paul Wolfowitzes, uh, these people have been chess moved in these high level positions, and they basically tell the people at lower levels in the U.S. military, uh, you know, where to go and what to do. And there really isn't a whole lot that people at lower levels can can do about it because they're in a hierarchical situation. So, uh, you know, I my my strategy has been to try to work with people who I think are honorable people who reflect traditional American values and, and maybe see there's some way that we can become stronger and we can expose 
what a lot of the malefactors who've been chest moved at higher levels, what, what they're doing and, and maybe turn things around a little bit. But, you know, obviously I, I think that the way DU has been played down is, is just uh, a total departure from reality at a minimum and, and, and at a maximum it, it's just totally it, – it's criminal, just the uh, – you know, I think Doug Rocky puts a figure of over now over a million. It used to be like 500, 600,000 of permanently disabled veterans, probably due to DU. I mean, the way uh, so many of these, these poor people are, 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 you know, and also they're not getting proper medical care. And the Army is not following its own directives for decontamination cleanup. It, it, it's horrible. And, and so I defer to I, – I, I support everything that Doug Rocky and Lauren Murray and many other people uh, say about DU. I, I say go to them. They, they've got the story. You know, I, um, and and, and I, I support their activist efforts 100 um, percent. There's a pattern of denial by the American people that you talked about. Uh, with me yesterday too, of cognitive dissidence in multiple yes. aspects. Could you um, could you tell the listeners again your philosophy on that? Well, uh, it's an old story, um, and in fact, I I wanted to write a, a series. I haven't gotten around to it yet. I just want a very project on the back burner, but one about I, I did a series on my website about reconciling opposing ideological viewpoints. Uh, to try to help people understand a little bit about how uh, different philosophical viewpoints influence the way they filter information and understand history. I also wanted to do a uh, a series on American history because our problems go back a long time. But I could say probably the one of the first major Orwellian shifts, or one of the big big Orwellian shifts uh, in American society was. Uh, during the the great unpleasantry between 1861 and 1865, to give you an example, you could claim that the the name the Civil War is Orwellian. It wasn't a civil war uh, because a civil war means two sides fighting for control over the whole area. The South basically wanted just to secede and be independent. Um, so uh, the Civil War is a misnomer. Uh, many scholars say a more accurate. Uh, term is the war against Southern uh, independence. Um, also, let's take the Gettysburg Address. Uh, H. L. Mencken demolished that in two sentences, saying uh, he is the great American concerned writer. It's great poetry, but actually the Southern cause uh, was closer to what the founding fathers uh, wanted. Four score and seven years ago, when they wanted independence from Great Britain, it's the South that wanted independence from an imperial entity. That's closer to the founding fathers than the cause of the North, which wanted to maintain uh, an internal empire at all costs. So, uh, you know, Americans, I, I think there's been a, a long trend of uh, disinformation. Getting we, we, we talk about the robber barons and then the creation of the privately owned Federal Reserve banking system, and then the way America got suckered into World War I. Uh, there's a lot of fraud involved in that. The incident was actually made up that got America into the war. And uh, so, I mean, there's a huge history there. And then, of course, the advent of TV. And so there's been a massive amount of, of ideological hijacking and brainwashing that's been going on for a very, very long time. So that's how I would begin to approach that topic. Well, too too many people trust the news to tell them the truth. Did you trust the news when you worked for CBS? Uh, well, initially, yes. Initially, I I thought it was fairly close to uh, reality, with maybe a little bit of liberal bias, uh, but nothing really serious. And uh, then after I, uh, you know, started, uh, well, actually, I, after I worked at Central Command and saw the difference between the mainstream media in the U.S. and then the Arab media. Um, then I took some other steps. Uh, I was alerted to some sources and alternative media then at that time. You had to get through mail order. Uh, on, and I started through a P.O. box uh, looking stuff on all ends of the political spectrum from the radical left to the radical right. And that's when I really started understanding the extent to which uh, what we got in media it was heavily concentrated and homogenized and uh, very hijacked. In fact, speaking of being at CBS, when I first got there, you know, I, sometimes being there, you know, at a certain place tells you something you don't really feel from just getting it from books. And when I was at the CBS headquarters, I'd look south, and you know, I look down Sixth Avenue, and I, I'd see it looks like a human 
Grand Canyon with all the tall skyscrapers. And within two blocks south was Rockefeller Center, which had the NBC headquarters. And then so I walk on the other side of the building facing north, and at that time in 1984, ABC headquarters was about two blocks north looking towards Central Park. And I was aware that according to studies, most Americans at that time got their information from television network news, and those three networks had a 75% rating, which means that uh, most Americans got most of their news from three networks that whose headquarters were located within a two-block radius of CBS, just three entities. And, you know, the executives there in the CBS headquarters would go, you know, if they make a job move, they just go two blocks to NBC or ABC. And, uh, you know, quite a few of them would all go through Grand Central Station commuting to and from work. And I thought, that right there tells me there's a tremendous concentration of media in this country. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I could actually go on. You have the Lichter and Rothman studies, which then showed me uh, uh, the, there were actually two uh, uh, Jewish scholars who talked about extreme bias in the media based on their quantitative media assessments. Uh, that appeared in American Enterprise. But then you can go more hardcore with the hard right, and then, for example, uh, you got the National Alliance who has their famous article, Who Rules America, at natvan.com, and they talk about the degree of Jewish ownership and their slant. And then, uh, you know, David Duke does the same thing. So you can do racial nationalist analysis. You can do libertarian analysis. Professor Bagdikian talks about corporate concentration of the media. And you can go in a lot of different directions, but what you wind up is tremendous concentration and slant in relatively few hands of American media. And that starts to help explain a lot. Uh, about how you know who who's, who has been molding the minds of Americans. We you have some um, some ex, you know work experience and um, that gives you a very unique perspective on all of this. And this is heavy stuff to deal with day in and day out. Just dealing with Fukushima, um, I could say that. How do you stay so positive? Well, <laughs> I've. When I was a real estate, there are a number of uh, approaches. When I was a real estate broker, you know, doing deals, you have to kind of learn how to take a deep breath and hang loose and keep cool and uh, just kind of roll with the punches. So that, that was helpful. Uh, also, I've come to appreciate how history goes in cycles. When I was a stockbroker, I saw how you had these manias like the Great Bubble. I mean, I was there at Dean Witter, which became Morgan Stanley from 1995 to 2000, the greatest bull market bubble in history. And I saw all these highly educated people following dot-com stocks, which had no fundamental uh, value whatsoever. And so I've seen the mania and madness of crowd, and I've seen over and over again industry groups where the so-called the best and brightest uh, pile onto things, and they look like complete idiots later on. And so that helped me appreciate how things go in cycles and how history goes in cycles. And so I, I had this feeling that, you know, th th there's only so much I can do as a human being that we're in the midst of these these vast historical cycles and just to try to survive and, and ride through it. Um, but I, I have to admit, uh, the idea that uh, there's mass genocide and poisoning going on in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, to include the United States, and this will very likely, if it follows the same trend as you know, what happened around Chernobyl and, you know, for example, uh, in Belarus and uh, many major areas of uh, northern Ukraine and, and Belarus, uh, uh, only 20 percent of kids are healthy. That's pretty heavy. I, I suspect that there are going to be major parts of the U.S. where that's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I wrote the uh, preface to the uh, 2007 edition of Civil War II, The Coming Breakup of America by Tom Chittum, which is sort of a right-wing classic in America. And, you know, I said, I don't want to see it coming, uh, but, and we want to stay this off or prevent it if we can. But to me, uh, you know, the, the Fukushima radiation helped bring down the, excuse me, the Chernobyl radiation was the punch in the solar plexus that played a major part in bringing down the former Soviet Union. And to me right now, it looks like in view of all the other social problems of, of possible coming economic collapse, the loss of our industrial base, uh, various forms of demographic conflict, uh, problems with uh, some uh, global elite groups who I think are criminally insane, like the Rothschild City of London and their confederates here at the highest levels of Wall Street in the U.S., all that combined with uh, a real blow to the solar plex of Fukushima radiation. Uh, you know, I think we've got some really rough sledding. But then again, hey, you know, 
uh, we've been uh, humanity's been through some rough sledding before. There's a bubonic plague that wiped out half of Europe in the Middle Ages. Uh, you had the collapse of the Roman Empire, where you know Rome got burned down. I mean, there's been some pretty horrendous times, wrenching times before in history, and you know maybe one way to approach is as, as horrible as it is, if you can sort of brace yourself and see what's coming. Uh, that that really helps a lot. It, it sort of reminds me of the story of Harry Houdini, who used to challenge people to come up on stage and punch him in the stomach as hard as they could. And then one day, as I recall, the way he met his demise, according to one source, is he was entertaining some college students at home, and suddenly a college student punched him in the gut as hard as he could, and that ruptured Houdini's spleen. And the college student said, but you, you, you said that anybody could come up to and hit you in the chest, in stomach as hard as they could, and it wouldn't be a problem. And he said, "Yeah, but that, that's only so. You know, I, no matter what's coming, I think first off, if we're prepared for it mentally, uh, that goes a long way for us figuring out how we're going to survive it and get through it. So that's that's one way to approach approach your question. You know, something that was discussed um, during the early days of Fukushima was nuking the site. Believe it or not, and um, you know, the United States loves its nukes. We don't want anyone else to have them. But we just learned last week about the tsunami bomb that was tested in New Zealand during World War II. We've nuked Japan twice before. Do you think that would ever be used to control well, what's the releases going on at Fukushima? And I know it sounds crazy at first, but if something ever happened to Reactor 4 and the spent fuel pool fell and created such a large uh, radiological release that no one could work on the site, it would only be a, a very short matter of time before reactor 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6 and the common spent fuel pool could go down as well. And you can almost entertain the thought of nuking the site at that time to pulverize it, aerosolize it, send it all up into the air at once people would have to shelter in that are downwind of this for a month if not longer do you think that the US would do that or would China or Russia have done that had they been the ones downwind of Japan you know, um, actually first off it was Lauren Murray who talked about how the Russians and American ex certain American experts uh, advised blowing everything in the ocean once it became clear that the meltdown had breached containment and was getting into the ground or was threatening to do that. And also Dr. Bill Deagles made that, that same point. And the reason for that is you don't want the corium to stay in a ball so it just keeps fissioning and fissioning and fissioning because first off all the water goes by, that becomes radioactive, becomes tritium. And if you can and you don't have to use a mini nuke, you can use high power conventional explosives. But the idea was if you blow that in the ocean, then the corium rather than representing this gigantic blob of molten nuclear material, it'll splatter and spread apart so you'll stop the fissioning. So that that was the concept and that could still be a threat. Now one of the problems, as, as Lauren Murray has explained to me, is the corium is now so deep underground that it's much harder now to dig something deep enough down there to break it apart, to cause it to splatter, to stop the fissioning. Although, once again, part of the, uh, many people would call the criminal negligence or cover-up is there are such things as ground-penetrating radars that have, I, I'm sure could be used or not being used. A lot of things that could be done uh, that are simply not being done. Uh, but uh, so, so that's certainly uh, one consideration. Now, another consideration, and, and this is an area where Lauren Murray has revealed a lot to the public, is one of the biggest problems is she has strong evidence that the Department of Energy has been deliberately running, controlling the Japanese reaction. Department of Energy, uh, uh, Steve uh, Kunin and... Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Stephen Chu, uh, uh, she's mentioned, and other people were chess moved in there, and they presided over the very bad American response to BP Gulf, and ultimately they were, she believes, are chess moved by the Rothschild City of London, and Obama's controlled by the Rothschild City of London. So there's something more nefarious going on as well in any of these responses. Unfortunately, there appears to be strong evidence that you have some uh, people who uh, are quite possibly uh, criminally insane, like with the Rothschild City of London and UK monarchy, who are ultimately guiding the reaction to this, uh, who are controlling the Department of Energy, which in turn is controlling the Japanese. So you have to deal with that 
political problem before you can even do anything really effective. I mean, I hear a lot of uh, people in alternative media, uh, leading experts, voice astonishment, uh, including Helen Caldicott and uh, uh, John Apsley and others, saying it's incredible given the seriousness of the situation. We haven't had, uh, you know, uh, these uh, high-level meetings of the best and brightest, the smartest physicist, the, the best talent around the world, mobilize massive resources. I mean, let's uh, throw everything we got at this thing, given the stakes. I mean, if this is 300 times worse than Chernobyl, Chernobyl, uh, by many estimates, caused within 25 years after the 86 meltdown, a million people to die and uh, 8 million to be permanently crippled. Actually, when you count, uh, those are living people, uh, mainly adults. When you calculate aborted fetuses and other things, it could be three or four million. But if you multiply just a million times 300, that's 300 million people, uh, 8 million uh, casualties uh, times 300, that's 2.4 billion. I mean, if we're talking about 300 million people dead between Japan and U.S. and Northern Hemisphere and 2.4 billion crippled for life uh, at 300 times Chernobyl, and I mean, this thing keeps circling around the Northern Hemisphere, uh, and we also, when you pile on, add on Fukushima radiation with radiation from prior events like Chernobyl, uh, bomb test radiation, depleted uranium releases, and nuclear power plant emissions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Lauren Murray and others claim that uh, since Fukushima, you know, first there was, uh, you know, she was up to about, I think, 12 counts per minute. Uh, with background radiation. I mean, it used to be 100 years ago, it was close to zero. Uh, she's in Berkeley, and now it's up to over 20, 24 counts per minute. It's more than doubled since Fukushima. I mean, there's a, and, you know, 100 counts per minute, according to California Highway Patrol, is a hazmat situation. So we, we know that low level radiation is very dangerous, chronic low level radiation. In the long run, it can be more dangerous than a sudden burst of high level radiation. It's called a pet cow effect. So, you know, we're playing a very dangerous game of roulette here. Uh, you know, how high does background radiation go across the U.S. Northern Hemisphere before uh, things just get too hostile for ordinary life to function? We just, or we get so many mutations, what they call, uh, evolutionists call genetic load, so many nonproductive people in our society compared to people productive, we just can't function anymore. I mean, this is a very dangerous situation. So, you know, getting back to uh, your point, you know, what's to be done? Uh, you know, we have a political issue of uh, there are apparently powers at the highest levels who are trying to paralyze a rational, immediate, total response, which is appropriate for this kind of situation. And so that's another thing we have to deal with. And unfortunately, the radiation isn't the only problem in our environment. In fact, one of the people that you talk about so much, which your research about mitigation for these things has brought you to, is Sherry Rogers who even before Fukushima was talking about how we already live in a permanently poisoned environment full of mercury, lead, cadmium, and various derivatives of plastic. Right. And she also talks about the full body burden and multiplier effect. And multiplier effect is something they usually talk about in accounting, but it can be applied to your health, too, when you have exposure to all these different things. How is the, the radiation affecting maybe core exit exposure that we're, that's raining out over the southern states right. that's still being sprayed over the Gulf of Mexico? It becomes a very, very complex issue from a public health standpoint, and when the public health departments aren't even talking about it, right. you know, you're, you're faced with, um, you know, large populations – that are being exposed to all these hazardous things are probably paying for it in terms of their health and, and don't even know. It's very um, frustrating to know that this is happening That's and right. and not really be able to do anything about it. And when you put this, this website together, um, one of the things you've been doing is sharing some of the um, mitigation that you've learned about. And you brought up yesterday with me this infrared therapy. Right. And could you talk a little bit more about that, about your skin being a major excretory system, not only absorbing radiation, but excreting some of the toxins that we're exposed to? Right. That's something I'm beginning to experiment. I, I view myself as like a like a junior uh, 
uh, unofficial medical student because I'm just trying to absorb the stuff as quickly as possible. Uh, one thing I like about Sherry Rogers, she's written uh, you know all these books, and she has uh, I think now she's in her uh, like 67 or 68 years old or something close to that. Uh, but she's been a medical doctor for over uh, 30 years. She has a lot of experience. And uh, that gives a lot of credibility for people who question other people who might be chiropractors or uh, naturopathic uh, medicine because she's been part of the mainstream, yet she gives good medical background uh, on all these different uh, areas. Now, one thing that she really extols is sonotherapy. Also, there's a Dr. Uh, Larry Wilson, I believe his name is, who wrote a book called Sonotherapy, and he, he's also been interviewed by um, Joyce Riley on the Power Hour, and they claim both – Dr. Rogers and Dr. Wilson, that sound, uh, infrared sound therapy is one of the most effective ways to detox. Uh, the point of infrared is uh, they claim that in a normal, you know, of course, people have been using sound as like the fins and American Indians with sweat lodges for tens of thousands, thousands if not tens of thousands of years, uh, but that takes a lot of heat and humidity and uh, can create uh, complications, whereas the infrared uh, it, it avoids the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, which gives the sunburns, and uh, but heats the skin down to about uh, one inch to one half inches beneath the surface, and helps produce a kind of sweat that apparently uh, helps the body to excrete um, many toxic tox, types of toxins, include uh, heavy metals and plastics that the kidney and the liver, which are two of the major excretory organs, uh, have trouble with. And it takes some burden off the kidney and the, uh, the liver. So uh, they advocate getting uh, infrared lamps. Uh, I mean, you can, you, if you Google online infrared sound, as you can see everything from uh, sound infrared built in hardwood cabinets with benches that cost 2000 bucks to the version that Larry Wilson has in sound therapy. He'll sell you a kit cost about 570 bucks or something close to that, some $500, $600 range. Or uh, I went out to Home Depot and uh, I got a uh, Philips a red infrared lamp uh, for just a little under 10 bucks, and then I got a holder for about uh, 12 and a half to 13 bucks. So that's about 23 bucks per lamp. If I can set up about three or four of them uh, around me in a, in a chair, uh, Larry Wilson has talks about having a swivel chair inside of like a little tent you can build. I think if I just turn my body and turn that on, it's basically a heat lamp. They say if you're really heavy, heavily toxed up, it takes a while to sweat. The more you do it, the easier is the sweat. And you should towel yourself off so you don't reabsorb the sweat inside your body. Uh, but people should be, uh, you know, you start off uh, with, you know, maybe five to ten minutes and you build up over time. Uh, but as you learn how to sweat, this is a good part of your daily routine is to uh, at some point in the day turn on your lamps and, and, and develop a good sweat routine. Make sure you turn your body and do other things. You have the lamps far away so you don't, get, you don't burn yourself. Uh, but get a good sweat pattern going, telling yourself off. And this is, a they claim, one of the most effective ways to detox possible. But another point I, it's, it's important to make is there's no detox method that has all the answers. I mean, a quick point that certainly Loren Murray and many others make is with 1,300 radionuclides, you know, you have radionuclides, different types, going in different parts of the body. The cesium going to muscles like heart muscles, and uh, you have plutonium, which gets into the gonads, and uh, strontium, which gets in the bones. Sometimes it gets into the, the, the bones or the brain and lodges there, and you can't get it out. So, I mean, don't get the idea that there's a magic bullet that one – four mode of detox is going to get rid of all your chemicals and all your radionuclides. I mean, talk to Doug Rocky, uh, who uh, has had a, a heck of a time detoxing himself from depleted uranium. So the first thing we have to emphasize is try to avoid exposure any way possible, which is why you know I was uh, promoting, I've been promoting the, the respirator thing and staying indoors or having a controlled environment. Be careful about tracking stuff in your house. But by the same token, because this stuff is so bad, I mean, radionuclides, internal contamination is bad, 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 bad. And any incremental uh, decrease you can make in this stuff is, is nothing but good, okay? So even if it's incremental, that's good, even if you can't get it all out. And so uh, a lot of these sources, and I agree with them, promote multiple approaches because – uh, you have so many different types of radionuclides react differently to different chelating agents or different therapies. You have to, you know, 
try sonotherapy. Then you have uh, some people advocate clay. I'm adv um, investigating that, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, calcium bentonite clay, uh, and then you have people who uh, say suppositories. Uh, suppository. Uh, with, for example, EDTA, uh, pacnicide, one's rectum when one goes to bed at night, helps to stimulate the lever to secrete. And my orientation now is to, hey, let's look at all this stuff and even try it all and experiment with it all and go full money uh, with detox, as well as also another concept, incidentally, Sherry Rogers and people like Dr. Mark Circus, who I also like a lot, um, is promoting is called nutrient loading. The idea is most Americans are deficient. In nutrients, so uh, you have to rebuild your magnesium. Uh, Dr. Busby talks about magnesium and calcium supplements. Uh, you need most Americans, like Dr. Brownstein says, over 90, 95 percent of Americans are deficient iodine. So you need iodine. So you need to. Uh, most Americans, Dr. Sherry Rogers says, are deficient in vitamin D. Uh, the best source she claims is cod liver oil. So we we need to rebuild our nutrition, particularly since we. So many Americans eat packaged food with all the crummy toxins in it, and uh, because of factory farming, our farmlands are stripped of nutrients. So we have to rebuild our nutrition and detoxify. And those two things right there go a long way towards staving off diseases or helping us manage our body burden, which we, we need to minimize in every every way possible. So uh, that's kind of I'm I'm exploring sonotherapy, and I want to get more into it right now. Uh, it does sound very promising to me. One of the guests that we've had on the show a number of times is Kevin Blanche, who's a very popular YouTuber, and he um, has cancer, and what he has said and what we've um, also mentioned on the show numerous times is to treat your health like you already have cancer. Take, right. you know, very good care of yourself, be an advocate for your own health, and don't leave it up to the doctors to fix you, and that's one in interesting thing about Dr. Rogers is she's very critical of the current medical establishment, as I am, having worked in it for almost 25 years. Right. You know, well, it's I'm, all about making money and pushing pills and not getting to the root cause of why people are sick to begin with. Right. In fact, so is Joyce Raleigh, the power hour, who is an organ transplant nurse. So is Dr. John Apsley, who I like a lot. So is Dr. Mark Circus. I mean, there are a lot of people out there uh, who echo what Dr. Sherry Rogers says, that the medical establishment is oriented towards the allopathic medical model, which is based on the idea that to cure something, you have to poison it or you have to block the symptoms or, or the pathways, the receptors, uh, rather than curing the underlying uh, disease. Uh, allopathic medicine is good at uh, trauma, uh, you know, like fixing a broken leg and, and surgery, but very poor. Uh, most doctors don't get... Uh, much education, anything to do with nutrition, and very little these days. Dr. Helen Caldicott talks about how the medical schools have fallen off on even talking about anything to do with radiation protection. They claim a major reason, it used to be at the turn of in 1900, uh, the medical profession was divided between allopathic and naturopathic. Naturopathic looks at building the immune system and nutrient loading, etc. But you had nefarious forces like the Rockefellers or Confederates of the Rothschilds, and they were looking to make money off the pharmaceutical industry. To And uh, the way you can't make money, all the things like iodine, which is a great nutrient, or magnesium, which are not patentable by the pharmaceutical industry. So there's a little bit of a scam where you, know, you have all these incredible... Uh, through you know uh, uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of years of evolution, you have the incredible variety of plants that have uh, these amazing compounds through Mother Nature and things like clay that have amazing properties and nutrients which do amazing things. But uh, doctors have been trained uh, and partly have been guided by some very evil people. In fact, the Corbett Report did some very good reports on how the Rockefellers really hijacked the uh, American uh, medical establishment uh, because it's about monopoly and control and uh, put them on, on a, a path where most doctors, uh, according to these critics, uh, claim that they're really working for the drug companies and the drug companies avoid natural remedies because they can't patent and make money off it. So instead, they create these synthetic, synthetic things uh, which, do, which poison you and instead 
you know, one of the concepts of Dr. Mark Circus and Dr. John Apsley and, uh, and, and Sherry Rogers, Dr. Rogers' advocate is nutrient loading, that instead of, you know, with, with, with allopathic medicine where you, you want to avoid getting, you want the smallest dose possible that still suppresses the symptom but, but not so large it poisons you, with the nutrient loading concept is it's actually pretty hard to, uh, to poison yourself. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get people to get, go hog wild with some of these things, but with, particularly if you use transdermal magnesium or iodine, you know, I put enormous amounts of iodine on it. Actually, one of the ironies is if you put enormous amounts of iodine on your skin, is initial, I've gotten a little bit of skin rash, but they say that's actually good because it's a halogen and it's driving out other. Iodine's good for you, the prostate and the sexual organs, as well as the thyroid and organs throughout the body need it, the gastrointestinal tract. It, it's a healthy thing throughout your body. Uh, but interestingly enough, as you have other halogens which are bad for you, like chlorine and fluoride in the water and bromine, which is put in white bread, and what will happen is, is you initially use iodine. It will chase the bad stuff out, and you'll begin to get rashes where that stuff's being excreted out of the body. And it, some people might freak out and say, uh-oh, I, you know, I got, I'm getting a toxic reaction from iodine. No, actually, you're doing something good for your body. But uh, I'm sure you, know, you can drink too much water. And so uh, you know, there are levels of iodine intake. Uh, that are toxic. I, I'm not. I, you know, I encourage people to. Uh, I, I can't prescribe anything myself. I'm not not a doctor. I'd be very careful about giving what appears to be medical advice. I encourage people, as a disclaimer, you know, to get with a physician, a naturopath, you know, and 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 and, and study these things before they they jump in. But uh, getting back to the basic point is, uh, a lot of these uh, sources, like Dr. Rogers. Uh, you know, point out in nutrient loading, you really don't have to worry so much about doing OD. Uh, your body uh, likes this stuff and it can handle high doses. She rec- her detox cocktail, incidentally, she recommends vitamin C. It's hard to overdose on vitamin C. That helps with radiation protection, cellular function. Uh, she also recommends lipoic acid, uh, which uh, that's incidentally, that's one of the main things that people use to uh, cure mushroom po- uh, poisoning, help self-functioning, uh, uh, and then glutathione, which he claims is a basic molecule. Every time your body wants to detox something, it usually attaches a glutathione molecule. Your body can manufacture glutathione, but you need to uh, help the production of that. See, as people, particularly as people get older, they don't produce as much of these things as they did when they're younger. So you have to help your body by taking these supplements and doing nutrient loading. So her basic detox cocktail, vitamin C, lipoic acid, glutathione. She loves cod liver oil. Uh, that, in fact, with people with heart attacks, when they take cod liver oil compared to control groups, it cuts their heart attack rate by 50%. She accuses the allopathic medical establishment of not even, rec- you know, uh, doing that. Instead, they do things that, some things that aren't even recommended or approved by the FDA, like certain types of, of, of stents and things like that. They're just, they're so focused on this profit model and things are patented and the idea that everything, uh, a disease has a genetic basis and you can cure it with drugs. Seems to be their mentality, whereas uh, she, uh, there's a whole wide world of the naturopathic approaches. It, it, I mean, it's been proven. You know, for example, there's there's a stretch in Louisiana between petrochemical plants where the cancer rates have skyrocketed. All right, so it's a no-brainer that certain chemicals cause cancer, exacerbated, all things being equal. It's been shown that studies in Germany, the kids who live close to nuclear power plants have more than twice the leukemia and other uh, autism disease rates. So it's a no-brainer that radionuclides uh, contribute. Uh, not only cancer, but exacerbate every form of disease. So if that's true, then if we're toxed up with chemicals and radionuclides, it's a no-brainer that before you go to drugs, I mean, the allopathic things that poison you, why not, you know, fill your body with the right nutrients and detox yourself as a first step and see if that cures you. Do that first before you go to uh, drugs, which uh, poison you in some way. So, uh, you know, that's... That's what one thing I think so beautiful about Sherry Rogers is she does have this extensive conventional medical uh, background. So if you understand that, and then uh, her how she sees the world from that perspective, combine that with the naturopathic. 
perspectives, a little more on naturopathic side, like Dr. Mark Circus, Dr. John Apsley, and then you've got, uh, well, I have this book by uh, uh, Sarah Shannon, I like that too, uh, Radiation Protective Foods, um, and uh, then also Dr. Cass Ingram is on the Power Hour, he's written a book about radiation protective foods, he, he sounds like he's on to some really good stuff too, and you know, understand that, that I think helps really give a person a, a good wide uh, perspective to, to help approach and educate the public as an activist. Um, Dr. Rogers has written a number of books. The one I'm most interested in is Detoxify or Die, and um, you can find those books on prestigepublishing.com. She also had mentioned, too, about you know, how, how many of the diseases that are affecting humans because of the toxicity of our environment are affecting animals. Even polar bears that live um, north of the Arctic Circle were showing signs, and this was before Fukushima even happened, of hypothyroidism and arthritis, which are largely due to buildup of toxins. Yeah, right. And, uh, right, right, right. Um, actually, there's a tricky issue there. In fact, I uh, spoke with Lauren Murray about my enthusiasm for Dr. Sherry Rogers. And, you know, I mean, uh, one comment I'll make is, uh, first of all, I, I don't want to claim – I, I, I think Lauren Murray is a really cool person. She's out in the Bay Area. You know, she's really into that scene. And so um, she is coming from, uh, you know, I, I, I just want to say it's a little bit of caveat. I, I did my analysis of propaganda and ideology, and I talk about how the political left is more the environmental view and the political right is more the genetic viewpoint. And it's like when you study psychology – uh, you discover that human behavior is a combination of the two, and if you do your analysis correctly, the environmental analysis should dovetail and fit hand in glove with the genetic analysis. And I feel the same thing about politics, that uh, she's more to the left, and that's, that's cool. That's a valid environmental analysis. Fine. I'm more to the right. I don't want to get the impression that, you know, uh, because I think she's – I, I really like her stuff that she's necessarily shares all my views. I, you know, I, I give that as a caveat with everybody I deal with. I'm kind of my own um, person. But one of the points she made is that there may be constraints on Sh Sherry Rogers to discuss the radiation issue because she has she's an MD, uh, and uh, you know, in a way the. Uh, you know, people like Chris Buzzy and Laura Murray have said that actually, you know, in a way you're comparing apples and oranges because radionuclides have chemical as well as radiation properties. Like, for example, the way uh, uh, uranium binds with the DNA, a point that Dr. Busby keeps making. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to compare one quantity of a radionuclide to quantity of chemical, but generally as a rule of thumb, you know, uh, uh, radioactive elements are, are 10 to 100 times worse than some kind of comparison with uh, their chemical components. So Sherry Rogers talks about heavy metals. Uh, she's been on Joyce Riley's Power Hour where people have talked about depleted uranium, and you know she hasn't contradicted that. But she, her focus is mainly on the chemical side. She doesn't, hasn't really directly addressed radionuclide. She's been more focused on, on the chemical side. But the point is you have a multiplier effect between the two. For example, on uh, there are a number of Indian reservations like the Navajo Reservation out west uh, where uh, the Indians are involved in uranium mining. And so it's interesting. As, this is a very good example where you'll have a control group of Indians who do not smoke. They do not work in uranium mines. And they, so they have a certain rate of cancer. And then you have another group of Indians. Of course, they're genetically pretty much the same, right, as, as a group. So we, we control for genetics that way and ethnic, ethnicity and racial factors, etc. Okay, so then you have another group of Indians that work in uranium mines, but they don't smoke, all right? And then you have another group of Indians that smoke, but they don't work in uranium mines. And then you have another group of Indians, a fourth group, that smoke and work in uranium mines. Now, you know, a person might think, well, what's the rate of cancer among the Indians who smoke and work in the uranium mines? And the answer is, well, first off, the Indians, you know, who, who uh, smoke uh, but don't work in uranium mines, their rate of cancer is higher than the control group of Indians who don't smoke and work in uranium mines. And similarly, the Indians who work in uranium mines uh, and don't smoke is higher than the Indians who don't smoke or work in uranium mines. But when you compare the Indians who do smoke uh, and uh, uh, do work in uranium mines, their rate is just like a multiple. It's not like you add the rate of the Indians who, 
who smoke but don't work in uranium mines and work Indians who work in uranium mines don't smoke. It's, it's not like you add those two groups together. It's like you 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 multiply to get the rate of cancer with their Indians who smoke and work in uranium mines. So there is a multiplier effect. That's why when you want to detox, you you, you got to get rid of that the chemical side, the plastics and and all the the, the gunk and the junk foods because that's multiplying times the radionuclides, even though the radionuclides may be ultimately a more potent form of poisoning than the chemicals, still since they multiply each other, you got to get rid of both of them. So that's, I think that's a very critical point. Have you um, personally tried to speak to any MDs, maybe your family doctor, about the Fukushima radiation? And if you did, what kind of reaction did you get? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know, being a veteran, I've spoken to people with the Veterans Administration, and I've talked about, you know, for example, iodine treatment uh, for ways to treat potential skin cancer and uh, other naturopathic sources. I, well, actually, I showed my uh, uh, article on the respirators, uh, you know, in the Fukushima radiation uh, to a nurse practitioner at the VA. And uh, that's here in Western Pennsylvania, and she said that the VA is really not in, in, does not address Fukushima radiation. And I said, "What do you do? You offer like uh, various forms of infrared or sauna therapy?" She said, "No." And uh, then I talked about depleted uranium. Uh, are you addressing depleted uranium? And the answer is no. And it was matter of fact, Dr. Doug Rocky. Uh, has given some interviews that were on the Power Hour, Joyce Riley, where he talks about how the VA has refused to provide adequate treatment or recognition uh, to many members of his team who've died of depleted uranium poisoning, and he himself has been given the runaround. And he was in charge of the uh, U.S. He, – he was the go-to man. He was the duty expert in the U.S. Army for uh, – decontamination related to depleted uranium. In fact, he, it, he was the commanding officer of the team that was given the task by General Norman Schwarzkopf, Norman Schwarzkopf after Persian Gulf War I in uh, 1990 and 91 to go in and, and try to decontaminate. He was out at the Nevada test site, and actually he determined that you really can't decontaminate sites contaminated with uh, depleted uranium. But he's complained about getting the runaround. So, uh, and... It's interestingly enough, uh, I was listening to some uh, interviews very recently, uh, uh, individuals speaking with uh, Joyce Riley about uh, uh, experience with oncologists. Uh, there's an Italian who, a documentary filmmaker who's done interviews uh, with uh, about forms of uh, cancer therapy that seem to work, like there's a, a doctor in Italy who recommends uh, a baking soda. Uh, which actually Dr. Mark Circus is also a big advocate of that's been effective in eliminating um, various forms of active cancer and uh, also various forms of iodine therapy, repeatedly treating the skin to get rid of basal cell or squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, this uh, Italian uh, filmmaker uh, talked about how uh, people over and over again had the experience of going through their oncologist who had cancer, and they talk about how things like uh, shark uh, 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 extract uh, from their uh, – actually, it's not bone. It's, it's a carcinoma or whatever. They, uh, they, uh, cartilage. That, cartilage, that's what I meant to say, yeah, uh, that that's been uh, shown to be effective against cancer. So, and, uh, so people go to oncologists, and they refuse to hear them. And uh, they suppress uh, any any form of alternative stuff. It's just not in their space. Uh, they, uh, the name of the documentary filmmaker, incidentally, is uh, Massimo uh, Mazzucco, M-A-Z-Z-U-C-C-O. Uh, well, well, actually, uh, well, maybe, or I'm just looking here from uh, a list, or maybe if I haven't got that exactly right. I think that's it. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly right. His documentary is called Cancer, the Forbidden Cures. And uh, he was interviewed on Joyce Riley's Power Hour. That was hour three on uh, 21 uh, June 2011. So she's on uh, GCN, the same network as Alex Jones, GCNlive.com. You can get her past shows on the Power Hour. And she's also interviewed uh, Joyce – well, uh, Joyce Riley has also interviewed Dr. Sherry Rogers as a regular for about once a month. Uh, going back for about the last two years. So you can go to 
some archives and uh, uh, on the Power Hour, just Google that and uh, get some of the, the past archives of, of some of these uh, shows if you want. Um, give us your website information again, and um, if you could maybe uh, tell our listeners what else you have on your website besides the Fukushima stuff, because there's a lot of good information on there. Yeah, well, my uh, author archive, at um, it's uh, I have two websites. They're pretty much the same. Uh, it's uh, www. Uh, the short version is amfirst a m f i r s t books b o k s dot com, or you can spell it out americafirstbooks.com dot com. Or um, I also have america dot com, or the short for that is www.amfir.com. But, you know, one of my goals was to try to counter what I consider just generalized brainwashing, the, the matrix. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why I created my series called, on the toolbar at the top, it says Resolving uh, Ideologies. And so I try to show these different uh, parameters of environmental versus genetic from, the behavior, from psychology, behavioral sciences, and then in management sciences, centralized versus decentralized, uh, to try to to help people see how ideologically America's gone from what I call genetic bottom up, which was sort of your paleo conservative viewpoint uh, at the time of the uh, in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, it's moved diagonally up, and, and also there's some anarcho libertarian too. Uh, like Tom Paine was a little more on the anarcho libertarian side, Jefferson in certain ways was too. But today, what we have is what I call a neo Jacobin. Uh, government. That's a term I got from Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. That means environmental top-down. Uh, one of the first pioneers of neo Jackman government, according to my 1957 Encyclopedia Britannica, was Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, where you, you basically have a centralized government that tells people that they're free, that it's preserving liberty, fraternity, and equality. But Napoleon had a secret police spy uh, on every square block of Paris, and he controlled all the French media. So it's the idea that you have a benign despotism or a benevolent ruler who enforces uh, liberal morality. Uh, and, of course, there's a little bit of contradiction there because the early American definition word liberty means absence of government. So, for example, you know, I, I'm currently living in Pennsylvania. Dr. Murray Rothbard, in a series uh, on uh, liberty, talked about how in the colonial period, uh, Pennsylvania had almost no government by European standards. You know, uh, in fact, uh, up until the, uh, I guess what I like to call the war of northern aggression against southern independence, I'm, I'm avoiding the Orwellian term of uh, civil war. Uh, you know, government, total government was no more than 5 or 10% of GDP. Uh, today, it's, it's just incredible. It's 50 to 70%, depending on where you are. Um, and, uh, you know, Americans rarely had, as the Mises, Mises.org is a great libertarian site, uh, you know, a lot of the lectures there, like Dr. Ralph Ryko and a series on uh, liberty, um, you know, talks about how most Americans never had any contact with government unless they went to the post office. You know, everything was decentralized at the local level. You had volunteer fire departments, volunteer local militia. And uh, so everything, uh, Americans made an interesting discovery, and that is compared to Europe, they, they grew almost to the size of a small European country, like Pennsylvania acted like almost like a completely sovereign, independent country, at times issuing its own currency as a colony. Uh, it was sort of out of sight, out of mind of the British imperial system. They decided when to wage war. Sometimes they operated independently. They resisted an overture by New England states to join them in certain Indian fighters or war projects. And so they acted really pretty much like a sovereign country, and they, they made an interesting discovery, and that was that they had almost no government by European standards, and, and they weren't missing anything. In fact, they're a lot happier and a lot of better off without the tax collectors and all the regulation and all this and that. And so uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is, is we've been hijacked now where we, we had the robber barons the late uh, 1900s. We had the, the, uh, the pro-Lincolnite unionists who established the totalitarian principles that the U.S. must be kept united at all costs, that secession is like a thought crime. Uh, despite the fact that there have been countries in history who have been able to secede, and, and both countries have been better off for it, like when Norway seceded from uh, Sweden in 1905, or Iceland got its independence from Denmark 
1945. It was done in a very gentlemanly fashion, and now they're good friends. So secession doesn't have to be bitter. It doesn't have to be horrible. Uh, it's in many ways comparable to uh, sometimes a large company when it gets to be inefficient, finds that by spinning off different divisions uh, that that's a good thing because they become refocused on the product line. So it's a great way to restore accountability and productivity. So you can see the same analogy on political. So the reason why I'm going off on this uh, sort of political tangent here is Americans have really been brainwashed to think that you have to have a strong central government that gets its fingers into everything that, that, and a centralized media that tells us how to think. And, uh, and uh, that's a big part of the problems we face today. So I wanted to try to deal with that uh, by you know, looking at ideologies and, and trying to look at um, – and then uh, I, I've got uh, stuff that explores um, you know, the false flag stuff, the Mission of Conscience series. Um, and uh, then I, I do a country analysis of Iceland uh, where it looked like Iceland is, uh, was basically infiltrated and corrupted by the Rothschild city of London – uh, it, part of, you know, you had the uh, international gamesmanship that's described in the book, The Blood Bankers, uh, or, and, and some other books um, that uh, describe the, uh, oh, uh, by John Perkins' uh, uh, Diary of an Economic Hitman about how uh, the uh, globalist bankers really act like users' lenders and do more harm than good to third world countries and use their lending activities as a way to try to rape the countries of the resources. And of course, you get into disaster capitalism. So I, I'm trying to get into why these these issues that sort of relate to each other because all knowledge is really interrelated and it gets back to the cognitive dissonance issue uh, that you raised earlier is, is most people are incredulous. I mean, how can we have an establishment with, with, with these horrible things happening where we're being slowly poisoned with Fukushima radiation and other forms of radiation, and they're not even telling us about it. How can they be that criminally negligent or reckless or whatever? Why are they this way? And once you start you know, you know, going down some of these rabbit holes, you connect to other rabbit holes, and you find out that actually uh, if you look at history and, and uh, you look at uh, other uh, uh, various interpretations of ideology, uh, from new perspectives, you find out that all the stuff interrelates, and, and you, you begin to see validation that helps explain uh, why we're experiencing what we're experiencing, explanations that I think are logically satisfying but are not explanations you ordinarily get in the mainstream media. Definitely check out his website, AmericaFirstBooks.com. I wanted to ask you, too, we're getting towards the end here. I don't know if you realize um, Jules let us go over because we were on such a roll that we actually extended the show an hour. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I did notice we were going beyond the hour. So, but, but I think that's great. I, I think you know what you're doing is really wonderful. I think we need a lot of different approaches. America is a polyglot country, America, different kinds of people with different values, and we all need to be awakened. And we need a lot of different approaches by a lot of different people. And I think you offer a fresh, new, uh, very important approach to reach people and uh, so I, I just salute what you've done so far. I mean, different strokes for different folks. I mean, I've got an approach that's sort of unique to my background, but I can't really reach everybody. Lauren Murray's got an approach that reaches a lot of people that I can't reach, and you've got an approach. And, uh, you know, I, I just think that, uh, uh, in fact, you know, I think of both your, Lauren Murray, yourself, and then there's another lady I like, Dr. Uh, Maya, her name's M-A-G-I-A, Nadison, who's a professor at Arizona State University. He gave a great lecture at Willamette State on, uh, she specializes in communications, talks about uh, the propaganda that's being used against Americans. She's a really neat lady. Uh, I helped organize an interview with her and Lauren Murray on Dr. Fetcher's show. And, and I think of you ladies, it's like the Joan of Arcs that are rising in this time of crisis uh, you know, you, Lauren Murray, Maya Addison, and other ladies, the Joan of Arcs, who are rising to the occasion to try to help save us in this time of, of frankly, you know, very, 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 very bad situation. And, and I just, I can't commend you enough for what you're doing. Well, thank you very much. And um, you have a lot to say, and you are so articulate, you need a radio show. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no, you, you should know. talk to Jules about that when we get done here. <laughs> you know, I, I actually have a number of different issues. I, uh, I'm 
trying to find uh, some kind of model in terms of uh, sustaining myself uh, at, and in terms of uh, donations and or selling things. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a very large uh, ebook uh, inventory. Uh, I got sidetracked on doing the research analysis on on the uh, and the Mission of Conscience series and the False Flag Attack Interdiction Project, but the. Uh, 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 Right now, a project I'm trying to work on is uh, putting together a work where I, I'm trying to uh, put together a lot of these different sources and address these different issues. Like, you know, what is the radiation threat? What is, um, you know, how is Chernobyl a good Rosetta Stone? You know, what's really happening with Japan? What's happening in America? Where do you go in the future? So that's the current project. Well, one other question I wanted to ask you before we run out of time is, um, are you still wearing your mask? <laughs> I, I carry it with me. And, uh, you know, I, I yeah, generally speaking, yes, I, I am still wearing my mask. But I need to acquire uh, more things. I need to, um, you know, I think it's important to have Specter alert to have something and show people that's beeping away. It's like Dr. Busby said, uh, the Japanese, when he was visiting Japan, they're getting uh, bit by, you know, everything looks normal, the birds are singing, you hear the car noise, but uh, people are getting bit, bitten by the invisible snakes of radiation that will ultimately kill them. And so uh, I think that that's, that's important. And so, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think. Uh, one of the points that was made in that that article on the respirator is it's true that a lot of the radionuclides are below the level of micron. They can go through any filter, uh, but it's also true that they attach themselves to dust and uh, moisture and that anything you can do to reduce contamination, even if, if it's only a marginal reduction, like 30 or 40 percent by absorbing dust in your filter, that's better than nothing. Everything helps. So, uh, yeah, I think that's something we shouldn't back away from. Uh, you know, I mentioned probably not a good idea to wear a mask when you're walking inside a bank. People might think you're going to try to stick them up. Uh, <laughs> you know, a lot, of, yeah, you know, a lot of merchants. I, I walked inside one store wearing my mask and my Fukushima activist sign, and this lady was the owner got really agitated. She thought I might be a terrorist or something. So I figured, you know, I, I probably, now, you know, another form of activism, and I, I haven't done it yet. I'm just a one-man band in, in many areas. And uh, But, you know, going to a local city council, approaching the local county sheriff, you know, uh, and, and just saying to people or local police and saying, hey, you know what? I've discovered sound of therapy. You guys are outdoors. And, you know, there are uh, local community meetings where people discuss issues, town hall meetings. And uh, talking to you know people, civic organizations, Rotary clubs, networking, and uh, you know I used to be a stockbroker and a real estate broker were a big part of success. Like Woody Allen said, is showing up. A lot of people need uh, personal touch. They need somebody to talk to. You know, with a lot of people, people uh, absorb information differently. Some people are very visual. You know, they they respond well to books. Other people are more auditory. Some people are more visual. Some people are more personal. They need somebody to talk to them. And so, you know, we need activism on a lot of different levels. And uh, yeah, you know, I think the the, the face mask activism, uh, you know, a way of of, of 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 making a presence in public that that can be effective. I I'm trying to figure out a way. For example, um, you know, you, if you put up a sign in your car. Uh, you may have state laws that say if you put in your back windshield mirror, they don't like that because you have laws against putting anything other than state decals that obstruct visibility. So you may need to get a magnetic sign that you put on your, you know, your back over or, or your back trunk uh, rather than obscuring a window. So maybe little tips and tricks like that. But yeah, you know, we we need to be. This ain't going away. You know, cesium has a half life of uh, 30 years. Uh, you've uh, got uh, forms of plutonium. You know that are just over 24,000 years, uh, you know, uh, depleted uranium, U-238 is, what, 4.5 billion years. I mean, uh, a lot of the stuff is going to be around for a long time. One of the rules of thumb is, uh, you know, 10 uh, half-lives. Uh, so uh, for cesium, which is a major component of the contamination, um, what I think, uh, what is tritium is like out to somewhere between 8 to 10 years. I've forgotten what it is, but, uh, you know, that... Uh, it doesn't even have to be a heavy metal 
but I mean, this stuff is going to be around for a long, long time. It's uh, going to continue to be remobilized with the wind, uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. You know, it's it's yeah, uh, an important point. I'll credit Michael Collins, who interviews a lot. He's out. He has EnviroReporter.com. He has yes. a good web. Yeah, he has a very good website, uh, and I, I encourage people to look his stuff over. Been a very good activist. In fact, he got on TV locally, Attack of the Show, and he got one of the Toxie Awards with his wife going to theater in L.A. and she dressed up uh, like being a, a toxic agent. And he's, he's and they, see that's cool. I like people who have fresh, creative innovative approaches to reach the public uh, but anyway um, you know he's in fact he's been detecting uh, levels of contamination in California oranges where if you treat the orange using um, EPA standards for liquids like water is way above the EPA standards uh, high relatively high levels of radiation is you know cesium with a 30-year half-life that's 300 years it's gonna be around a while um, People on the West Coast are going to be hitting, getting hit with more the radiation in the ocean that can carry in between uh, many miles inland, just like you can s smell a sea spray. That's going to be hitting in the next uh, year or two. So we have some very, very serious problems that are coming at us, and uh, and and the way they get worse. That's the lesson of Chernobyl, is uh, from bioaccumulation. Often these. Uh, problems get worse, and that's the point Michael Collins keeps making in his interviews. Is this is unlike other disasters where they hit, and then they sort of get damage control and they're sort of over with a few months later. This is a unique form of. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your extensive knowledge and experience with us. Please check out his website. We will be back next Tuesday. Share love, caring, and concern for your fellow man. And stay safe, everyone.